Welcome to Lunchtime Babbling. My name is Shay Brown. I'm the CEO of Babbel AI, a company that audits algorithms for bias, ethical risk, and effective governance. I'm joined once again by our COO, Jeffrey Raker. Jeffrey, how's it going? Yeah, it's going all right. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me on. Um, I, I probably should jump in and say quickly that I pro people probably notice uh, we look a little different. You and I are both traveling visiting family at the moment uh <laughs> we switched summer time yep switch switching continents um so uh yeah it so if you notice uh, a different background if you notice I, I don't have my mic today so i apologize for that but uh it it, it puts us for uh it puts us on our toes <laughs> yep yep gotta have vacation gotta yeah <laughs> en enjoy the summer yeah so well, navigating uh, family is a is its own <laughs> thing as well, but yeah, it's its own its own thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, normally you are in Europe and I I am in Iowa, and we've we've switched places, so that's the that's the big the big change. So, what are we going to talk about today? I think we've even that though it's been summer, we've been pretty busy, and we've been working on a lot of audits and consulting. You've been working a lot on the sales side of things what are, what are we hearing and what do we want to talk about uh yeah so this week i want to go over the eui act um i i hope people aren't sick of hearing about it but it just uh it's officially it's officially a thing people need to start getting ready and we're we're starting to see more and more people asking for help around it so I, i've put together with uh with some other Babel members a list of questions um that we want answers to as it relates to where people should start uh to get ready with the eu ai act so it's a usually we're a little more free flow um but this these are really important questions that i think we should we should highlight and answer so i'll just like go through them and then uh and let you you answer to the best of your ability <laughs> all right all right this is uh or oral exam I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, let's let's flip the exams uh, to the to the teacher now. <laughs> so uh, the first question: What are the primary objectives of the EU AI Act, and how does it aim to regulate AI technology within the EU? What impact will it have outside of the EU? Okay, so there's a lot there. Let me try to be concise. So it's a harmonized regulation that lays down very specific rules for what is or is not allowed uh, and also lays down very specific rules for the actors who needs to comply with what. And for anyone doing business in the European Union that has using AI, they're going to have to follow these rules. And so uh, they'll have very specific obligations if you're a provider of an AI system, if you're a deployer. The provider is a person who builds the AI and packs it into a product. There's some nuances there, but we can get into later. And then a deployer is someone who, let's say, uses that AI in a service or just internally with their organization. Um, the impact outside of Europe will be uh, primarily on the provider side in the sense that a lot of providers might come from the developers of these products are going to come from elsewhere outside of Europe. They will have to comply if they're selling into the European Union. Um, for, on the deployer side, it mostly affects people who have offices or are located in Europe. And so if you're there and you're like a hospital, if you're a, any kind of organization, you use what's considered high-risk AI, then you will have to comply with a number of obligations. Uh, but it, it ultimately is going to affect everybody. Awesome. Um, so I'll jump into the next one. What specific aspects of AI systems will be audited for compliance within the EU AI Act? Yeah, so there's a there are kind of two components here. So let me let me first break down the audit side of things. For audit, what they're calling audit is really a conformity assessment. So anybody who's done like an ISO certification, that's really like a conformity assessment. Are you conforming with a particular standard? And so that's what the audit is about. And those audits, 
And then there's also things like uh, assurance, which is what Babel does, where we can uh, provide assurance that people are compliant with almost anything, certain regulations. Um, now, the parts of the AI system that need to get audited are there's a comp there's AI system specific components, things like do you have is there like monitoring associated, logging associated with the AI system? Is there a human in the loop or human uh, uh, human intervention when there needs to be? Uh, are there tests and monitoring available to to sort of test for things like bias and accuracy? Do you, are there, is there technical documentation? These are kind of AI system specific things that will need to be audited or checked for conformity. There are also organizational aspects that will have to be audited. So things like, do you have a risk assess, a risk management system? Do you have like an overarching quality management system? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, and in the case of deployers, there might there are also other things like uh, fundamental rights impact assessments and things like that if you're a, a public institution. So there's the kind of these two components, real specific to the AI system, and then also organizational requirements. Awesome. So the, the next question is, are there any particular high risk AI systems that require special attention under the new regulations? Yeah, so they do have a risk-based system. We've talked about this on the podcast before. There's sort of prohibited risk systems where you just literally can't use them. That's the average person is not going to have to work. The average organization is not going to worry about that. Uh, most of them will be worried about this high risk and the high risk are in categories like uh, uh, HR, like hiring, promotion, other kind of uh, HR related functions, biometrics, uh, um, insurance, these kind of things that make consequential decisions. So those are the, in the high risk categories, the biomet. So all of them need, there are a huge number of obligations that you have to worry about. The ones that require some special attention would be things like biometrics, because as of right now, these so-called annex three high risk systems, uh, most of them do not require an external conformity assessment. I think a lot of people are still going to get them and this is likely to change in the future, but right now they don't except for these biometric uh, kind of remote biometric systems. And they do have to have external conformity assessments. The majority of the other kind of safety things like autonomous vehicles and stuff like that, they have to go through conformity assessment that's related to their industry specific standards. But uh, so I would say biometrics is a really important one. That being said, I think that there are some things like hi hiring, which is something that Babel works on a lot, HR related systems, they have a, they're highly scrutinized. And I would say that systems, AI systems in that area and education also falls on, would also be related to this. Those are two areas where I, I'm going to expect a lot of scrutiny and probably a lot of early enforcement action around those just because it's so obvious when they go wrong. So in my mind, if I were giving advice, if you have a system of that type, you definitely want to pay attention to conformity because it's, it's going to be come under scrutiny. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask my, uh, a follow-up question for this as well. Um, so as people are starting to classify their tools and make a list of all of the AI tools in an organization, I, I think, Sometimes AI kind of sneaks its way in, you know, like everybody's, if you got a WhatsApp, if you got Facebook, you got LinkedIn, all of a sudden there's a new AI tool, whether you're aware of it or not. What are some signs for people to look for when it comes to biometric tools? Um, are they just completely obvious or uh, is there something where you, you don't even realize, oh, it's listening to my voice? Yeah. So that the... There are obvious ones like when there's a camera on and you need some sort of facial. Uh, so there's a difference between like just sort of biometric and then like remote biometric. Remote biometric, in some cases, like if you have really unconstrained remote biometric identification, that's actually, or like just gathering of people's faces, that kind of thing is actually in the prohibited risk category. But then sort of like standard biometric stuff where it's like I'm logging into my iPhone or I am trying to get into 
my computer through or my bank and there's some sort of face detect uh, recognition kind of going on those are obvious ones where those systems have ai they use ai other ones like voice or pattern recognition with voices or using those to identify people those are more sneaky and the end it really depends on uh you have to look very carefully at the terms and services for some of the things that you're using to understand whether those uh, AI is being used. Now, if you're a provider of the system, you should know whether you're using AI. And the definition of AI is pretty broad in this case. It doesn't have to just be machine learning. Um, and so you definitely want to look carefully at that uh, and, and know whether... But anytime you're trying to identify a person based on some data that is not their ID necessarily, um, or their login, that often could be biometric. Yeah. And if you're a provider of these tools, you're probably going to want to talk to your clients and, and be, let them know what, uh, what's all in there and how it relates to the law. Yeah. Um, so my next question is how do you assess and manage the risk associated with AI systems? No small question. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so the context of this conversation then is people who are just starting out. Yes. Right. So I'm, I'm putting myself in the position of like a, an AI startup, somebody who is clearly high risk, like are going to have to comply with the act and, but hasn't really got matured in terms of, of being compliant at the moment or just trying to figure it out. In this case, I think that starting with risk assessment is the primary, the primary task. So you categorize your system and, and figure out, are we high risk or not? Let's assume that you're high risk and you figure that out, right? That's a, that's a, a whole other beast on its own. And you can reach out to us if you've got questions on how to do that. But once you've categorized that, then the question is, what are the other risks? Now that it's considered high risk, let's actually articulate what those risks are. And we have some, and we should link it below. We, we have some cheat sheets for this where there, where you can just go through a very simple process on your own, but you have to assign a group of people who understand the product first. So you need people who are in charge of this, and then you need to take them through a structured process to identify the stakeholders. What are the ways in which those stakeholders interact with your AI system? And what are the potential failure modes or ways that their interests which you should also articulate could be impacted by the AI system. And it's, it's not a hard process if you, you just need to practice it and it needs to be something that you work on as a team, but that's the basic process is you sort of go through the structured looking at your system and figuring out where does your system impact people's interests or rights, and then identify mitigations that are going to limit the possibility for your system to impact that that's the mitigation part of this. Um, both of which are required, but the assessment or the detection of those risks is the first step. Awesome. So uh, my next question is, what are the key provisions and requirements of the act that businesses and AI developers need to be aware of? How do we ensure that our AI systems comply with GDPR and other relevant data protection regulations? Yeah, so there's a lot there. I think that the key provisions are going to be in... Uh, if you're a provider of these systems, there is a whole, uh, there's a whole chapter on, um, and let me even see what the chapter is. Uh, yeah, chapter three, high risk AI systems. And so if you, if you look at chapter three of the EU AI Act, it will outline uh, provisions or, or uh, articles that will target whatever kind of actor you are. And if you're a provider, there's a whole list of them. The key provisions here is that if you're a provider, you need to have a quality management system. And so anybody who's gotten like an ISO certification will recognize this term. A quality management system is really a bunch of policies and procedures and tools which are going to govern the quality of your AI system. ISO 42001 is a great start for that. But you can just, if you're just starting out, you don't need to get certified on that. You can just start putting in policies in place. Underneath that quality management system, risk management is going to be a big one, uh, which we just talked about. 
But then there's also going to be a lot of more technical things where you have to be testing for accuracy and robustness of your system, validation of your system. You have to be logging and monitoring. You have to think about human intervention. And almost more importantly, I think, or one of the harder things is you're going to have to communicate to the people, your clients, all of these things. So there has to be, there's a big transparency component here. And I think those transparency components are, can be some of the harder things. You have to explain your system. You have to really lay ground rules for how people should use your system. Um, now, you mentioned GDPR. Privacy is one of the important kind of fundamental rights that people have. And the EU AI Act has sort of recognizes fundamental rights uh, and looks the risk assessment process and the risk mitigation process uh, is looking at how the systems impact fundamental rights. Privacy is one of them. Now, GDPR is the law of the land still. And so you should be compliant with GDPR now. But if you're not and you, you, you're you using uh, the EU AI Act as an excuse to start thinking about it, try to make it holistically combined. It's one of those fundamental rights that you have to. So you have to worry about consent and that sort of thing. I will have one note really quickly that there is a carve out for GDPR, for bias testing. So you can collect data for the purposes of testing your system for bias, demographic data, for instance, or personal personal data. Um, but there's a there's a number of restrictions uh, that you you know have to erase it when you're done and all of that kind of thing. But there there's a carve out in GDPR to kind of get the data you need, um, other than some of the other lawful bases that you could use. So. I'm just being aware of time right now. I think we might want to break this into a one-parter and a two-parter because I've got quite a list of questions, actually. Um, so I'll ask this one last question, and then maybe we'll uh, we'll call it a day here, and we'll do a second uh, a second episode, maybe follow up next week. Um, so it'll be a quick turnaround. Perfect. Um, but the the next question I have is how often should these audits or conformity assessments be conducted to ensure ongoing compliance? Yeah. So there's, there's sort of, um, two answers to that question. There's going to be, I think the external assessments every year makes sense yearly. Um, but I think that there should, there's, if you're, if you're doing internal assessments, that should be much more like quarterly basis. You should, so it, really check in your system because not some of the components are not going to change. Like your risk management process will probably be pretty similar, but you're going to be collecting data from the use of your system and you're going to want to track things like accuracy and robustness. And so it makes sense to the, what they call it post-market monitoring in the act. That post-market monitoring does need to be continuous, but then you should revisit internally a lot of these things. Now, having an external party provide assurance, let's say, that's going to be a, on a yearly basis. But I know that like for our experience working with clients is we, we talk to them throughout the year in between these sort of big audits because they always will have questions. And I think that's the attitude you should have is sort of uh, assurance should be something that approaches continuous assurance. Um, but the really the checkpoints for the audit are going to be yearly. Let, let me ask a really quick follow-up question to that. I think there's going to be a desire to automate a lot of this um, for obvious reasons. How, and I don't even know if you can answer this, but how much of this can you automate or should you automate um, the you know the list of things that are in the EU AI Act? Well, I think there's, there's a real benefit to having some automation in place. It's more... The automation is more like a lot of this has to be humans doing things, right? The humans that are assessing risk, humans making judgments on things. You can't take the human out of it right now, at least for the near, the short term. So, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't have automation in processes in place where you sort of automatically check on things or it reminds you, right? This is what a lot, there's a whole industry now of these platforms that are out there trying to do that. That's totally okay. But there always has to be human involved and there's going to be a ton of expertise that's needed to get this right, to set it up. Uh, and for external assurance, 
so those conformity assessments and or assurance engagements and that uh, the, uh, those sorts of things you're you're gonna you can automate that you can automate some aspects of it we work we're working on that as well but there still needs to be a human who's making a judgment at some point saying this is okay or this is not okay and that's going to take at least in the near term a significant amount of expertise and some manual effort there will be a day where it won't, will be it will be much much easier just like with cybersecurity but even cybersecurity audits are are there's a lot of manual work that still has to get done awesome so i think uh, i think we'll take a break um just looking at the time and again we might do a one part or two part or uh, this might just be a break i think i've got uh nine more questions i want to get through so we'll see how how this yep. looks like in terms of timing but uh I think they'll we'll take a break for now. All right, that's perfect. So if this is a, a complete episode, then um, thank you for uh, watching. If you're on YouTube, uh, we appreciate a like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on a podcast, thank you for listening. And uh, we'll see you again on the next Lunchtime Babbling. Thank you.